Hello, everyone, and welcome to this ePanel event on charting the future of immunology and immunotherapy to honor the awardees of this year's Michelson Philanthropies and Science Prize for Immunology. I'm Shannon Wyman, the Scientific Communications Manager for Keystone Symposia, and I'll be your host today. Thank you for joining us. This ePanel will feature Drs. Paul Bastard, Scott Beering, and Lisa Wagger, and their groundbreaking work to understand and combat emerging infectious disease threats. These rising stars in the field of immunology are setting the stage for better pandemic preparedness in the future. They were selected through a global competition for the transformative and impactful nature of their research to accelerate vaccine development and immunotherapeutic discovery. We will kick off the event today with some remarks from scientific and political leaders about the selection of the awardees and importance of their work to society. First, we have a few words about the prize partnership from Dr. Holden Thorpe, Editor-in-Chief of the Science Family of Journals. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you all. And this is a very exciting day for science and the Science Family of Journals. Uh, it seems like not very much time since, since Gary Michelson came to us with his idea of, of partnering with us on this prize. And it's such a privilege to work with a, someone like Gary, who uh, is, is a great scientist in his own right, understands uh, so much about uh, research and how it's done, uh, values uh, uh, enhancing the careers of young scientists, and has uh, such a focus on one of the most important frontiers uh, in science, and that is in immunology. Uh, we couldn't be happier uh, with the process uh, that led to the three winners. And I want to thank my uh, outstanding colleague, Seth Scanlon, who uh, does such a great job for us um, in running immunology for the journal in general and uh, was the leader of the scientific process that led us to these three outstanding award winners. Um, and of course, we're always excited when there are a few science papers uh, and science immunology papers that pop up in the winning uh, entries, and uh, we're so we're we're happy to see that as well. Although uh, that's certainly not a requirement uh, to win the, this prize, these prizes, but we love it when that works out. And um, in particular, uh, I just looked up uh, Paul Bastard's paper. Uh, has been downloaded 41,000 times. So uh, we're, we're super excited about that uh, and about the essays that we got uh, from all three of these outstanding award winners who are all just absolutely wonderful to work with. So thanks to Gary Michelson for his vision, uh, not just for uh, this prize, but for research and humanity and everything that he is doing to make the world a better place. Uh, and thanks for letting me be with you all today. And I'm gonna turn it uh, back over uh, to Shannon to uh, bring on Dr. Michelson. Great, thank you, Dr. Thorpe. Um, and yes, next we have a few remarks from Dr. Gary Michelson, founder and co-chair of Michelson Philanthropies. Good morning. So first, it's been an absolute joy to have partnered with science. The whole team has been great. And I particularly have enjoyed the time I got to spend with Holden and Sudip, um, both of whom I admire greatly. It's just been a pleasure. Um, I think we're all aware of just how difficult it is for young scientists to get funded to do their own research. And for scientists in general to get funding to do out of the box, high risk, but potentially high return research. So one of the purposes of these awards is to shine a light on those problems. But another purpose is to actually recognize uh, the brilliance and imagination of these young scientists who are winning these awards this year. And finally, um, if history holds, probably the best purpose will be that these awards will alter and accelerate the trajectories of their careers. My wife and I offer you our warmest congratulations, and we're looking forward to hearing your presentations. Thank you. 
Wonderful. And now a few words from Dr. Bill Moran, publisher of Science Family of Journals, who will provide some perspective on the prize selection. Hello, uh, this is Bill Moran, publisher for Science and the Science Family of Journals. Um, I'd just like to take a minute to say one thank you to everyone for attending and congratulations to our award winners. Um, and I also take a little time to talk about the prize itself. Um, because behind the prize is also the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, that I consider the publisher of science. Um, and as our mantra is over at the AAAS, it's uh, advancing science and serving society. And this is one way we do achieve that mission. Uh, this partnership with uh, Michelson Philanthropies is one way uh, for us to give back to the scientific community. Uh, you've heard both of my colleagues beforehand mention the concerns over early career research. Um, and this is an important area for us. And this prize is one small way of trying to recognize uh, some of the issues and concerns of a traditional funding in this area for early career researchers. So with that, I do want to say thank you to the community and for all of you for attending and my colleagues. And again, congratulations to everyone. Um, and the award winners, your research is fantastic. And you are also serving society with this research. So thanks again. And back to you, Shannon. Great. Thank you, Dr. Moran. And now we have some remarks from Mr. Alex Padilla, United States Senator in California on the impact of this research to society. Hi, I'm Senator Alex Padilla, and I have the honor of representing California in the United States Senate. I want to thank Michelson Philanthropies and Science Magazine at the American Association for the Advancement of Science for your investment in the next generation of scientists. I'm a proud graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with a degree in mechanical engineering, so I know the value of investing in researchers and research institutions and I'm proud to be a champion for science in Congress. That's why I support increased funding for the National Institutes of Health, so our world-class universities can continue to conduct groundbreaking research. I'm also co-leading the Restore and Modernize Our Nation's Labs Act to invest $30 billion in America's national labs. Bold research can reshape our understanding of the world and accelerate innovation. Our nation depends on scientists with big dreams and the perseverance to discover. Just look at the revolutionary development of COVID-19 vaccines. As we reflect on the lessons of the pandemic, we must renew our commitment to scientific research. It's critical to invest in early career investigators who are laying the groundwork and preparing for future pandemics or curing diseases that affect millions and we must do more to support women and people of color in the scientific community. Diversity in the research environment drives new discovery. The rising stars we celebrate today are tackling urgent questions in immunology and vaccine development that will shape the future. Congratulations to all of the honorees and thank you to everyone supporting their research. And finally, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Seth Scanlon, editor of Science Immunology, who will tell us about the selection process and introduce the awardees to present their work. Uh, thank you, Shannon, for that uh, fine introduction. So I'm the immunology editor uh, at Science, um, and uh, I've had the privilege of um, having a role uh, in this uh, first year of the prize. So the, the Michelson Philanthropies and Science Prize for Immunology was established to recognize recent cutting edge work in the field of immunology by early career scientists. This prize has a particular focus on transformative research that has the potential to greatly impact how we understand and treat human disease. The 2022 prize was open to individuals with an MD or PhD aged 35 years or younger. 
Entrants were required to submit an essay of no longer than a thousand words describing their contributions within the past three years to human immunology research based in their field of study. We accepted entries for the prize from mid-May of last year until the beginning of October. Once entries were closed, each application was assigned to at least two science editors who separately evaluated each essay. The essays were rated in two areas, first for their scientific quality and significance, and second for the clarity and style of writing. This year's applicants were outstanding in terms of both research quality and topical and career stage diversity, which was all the more astounding given the fact that this was the prize's first year. Applicants from around the world highlighted their work in areas such as vaccine development, cancer immunotherapy, and antibody engineering. Some essays tackled the role of the immune system in pathological processes like neurodegeneration, heart disease, autoimmunity, and cancer. Still others reported advances in our understanding of how the human immune system fights important pathogens, such as Mycobacterium ulcerans, influenza virus, and SARS-CoV-2. Based on these editor ratings from the first round, we were able to shortlist eight applicants who were then assessed by a jury comprising both science editors and leading researchers in the field of immunology. This jury had the unenviable task of determining the winner and runners up for this year's prize among a trop, crop of truly terrific essays. Still, even among these stellar candidates, three entries stood out. Lisa Wagger's essay describing her work using organoids derived from tonsil tissue to study human immune responses to influenza vaccines was both very readable and accessible and described work that has the potential to fuel future innovation in the development of vaccines. Scott Beering's essay detailed the development of a cross-reactive antibody that can function as a therapeutic targeting multiple flaviviruses. The need for safe flavivirus vaccines is very high, and this sophisticated study utilized both structural biology and in vivo animal work to reach its very promising and impactful conclusions. Finally, our winner, Paul Bastar, submitted a compelling essay describing work that is both timely and has potentially broad implications for other viral infections. His research stood out to the science editors and judges for its exceptionally important identification of factors that can contribute to COVID-19 severity and which can be recognized prior to infection allowing people with particular vulnerabilities to protect themselves. More broadly, this work may also explain some of the variability seen in immune responses to other viruses and help inform clinical practice in the years to come. Before I introduce the three finalists, I would like to conclude by thanking some of the many individuals who have helped make this first year a stunning success. I'd like to thank Editorial Coordinator Mary Rose Madrid for organizing judging assignments and keeping me on my toes. I'd like to thank Roger Goncalves and the Science Prize team for their help liaising with the Michelson Philanthropies. I need to thank my colleagues at Science for their help evaluating these essays. I'd like to thank members of our grand jury whose insights were invaluable in helping us determine a winner, namely our perspectives editor at Science, Gemma Alderton, uh, Andrea Schiedinger at uh, Sloan Kettering, Wolf Dietrich Hart at ETH Zurich, and Danny Altman at Imperial College London. I would also like to thank Jesse Slater, the executive assistant to the editor-in-chief who edited the three finalist essays. Finally, I would like to thank Bill Holden and Dr. Ga Dr. Gary Michelson for their strong and unwavering support, which was critical in making our inaugural prize such a success. I find myself extremely privileged to have had this opportunity to help highlight and champion early career immunologists who are performing such important and cutting edge work, which should have real and lasting impacts on human health. We're now gearing up for next year's prize, and I encourage all the young immunologists watching to consider submitting an essay describing your work. Happy writing. Our first runner up, Lisa Wagger is an assistant professor in physiology and biophysics at the UC Irvine School of Medicine. 
She received her PhD in immunology at the University of Toronto under the mentorship of Dr. Tanya Watts, and then went on to a postdoctoral fellowship in Dr. Mark Davis's lab at Stanford University. My name is Lisa Weiger. I'm an assistant professor at the University of California, Irvine. I received the runner-up prize for the Michelson Philanthropies and Science Prize for Immunology for my essay on deciphering immune responses to vaccines and infectious diseases using human immune organoids. I've always dreamed of being a scientist ever since I was a little kid. I was very excited about understanding how the world works and taking things apart and putting them back together. I was drawn to the field of immunology because it became more and more clear with my education and my training that immune cells play a crucial role in virtually every human disease. I've been studying the human immune response for over a decade now. My current work is focused on using immune organoids, which are a mini organ in a dish, to try to understand connections between immune cells. So we create these mini organs out of tonsil and other lymphoid tissues. We watch these cells re-aggregate in vitro, and then we can understand what the immune response looks like to vaccines and infectious diseases in culture. My future goals are to improve human health through enhancing vaccine design. We hope that the immune organoids will leverage our ability for precision medicine and enhancing the immune response to infectious diseases. The Michelson Philanthropies and Science Prize for Immunology comes at a very crucial time for my research. I started my lab at UC Irvine in July of 2020, and since then, my team is focusing on further enhancing the physiological relevance of immune organoids derived from primary human tissues and hopefully leveraging that information to improve future vaccine design. Hi there, my name is Lisa Weiger. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics here at UC Irvine. Today I'm going to tell you about my work on deciphering immune responses from humans to viruses and vaccines in a tonsil organoid platform. My research interests lie in understanding human immune responses against infectious diseases and vaccines with the ultimate goal of trying to predict who's going to make a robust, a durable, and a protective immune response and trying to contribute to vaccine and adjuvant designs that will promote protective responses in as many people as possible. One of the major barriers that exist to addressing these types of questions has been a relatively limited set of tools to help us investigate human adaptive immune responses at the site where they're forming. It has been surprisingly difficult to identify correlates of protection, aside from neutralizing antibodies, from peripheral blood studies. Dr. Donna Farber, Dr. Ali Alabedi and others have recently published beautiful work examining T and B cell responses from human lymphoid tissues. But really the logistics of doing such studies can be a major barrier to research and sample sizes often need to be quite small for these types of studies. On the other hand, animal models have really had a limited ability to recapitulate the constellation of factors that contribute to normal human immune variation, including age, sex, immune history, genetics, the environment, as well as many other factors. So rather than trying to eliminate these factors, my work has aimed to embrace the chaos of human diversity and try to study these differences to better understand host factors that account for immune variation. One strategy to overcome these types of issues that I just mentioned is to try to develop a representative in vitro model of the human adaptive immune response that would help us to bridge the gap between preclinical animal models and clinical trials. I focused on using tonsil tissue as a source of material because all things considered, it's really one of the most accessible lymphoid tissues from otherwise healthy patients. This tissue is typically discarded during tonsillectomy surgeries of which there are more than half a million performed in the US annually. And common indications for surgery include tonsillar hypertrophy, so just enlarged tonsils, and obstructive sleep apnea. 
In addition, tonsils share many functional similarities with lymph nodes, including germinal centers. I've pointed out some follicles here that you can see from a tissue section. And these germinal centers can lead to affinity maturation of the antibody response, just as you would find in a lymph node. To better study the human adaptive immune response, we developed a novel immune organoid platform. An organoid is an in vitro model that attempts to recapitulate the function, cell composition, and or the structure of an in vivo tissue. We developed a re-aggregation style organoid method that's derived from primary human tonsil tissues with a focus on three main points. First, that the cultures would need to adequately mimic the original structure and function of lymphoid tissues. That is, that they're capable of coordinating an antigen-specific B and T cell response. Second, that this platform would enable us to do more mechanistic experiments through, for example, cell depletions or enrichments or other manipulations. And third, that they could be prepared with sufficient throughput and scalability that we would be able to look at hundreds of cultures from the same individual, stimulated with different conditions. Ultimately, this is the workflow that we developed to produce immune organoid cultures. So we receive these tonsil tissues after the patient's surgery. We then mechanically dissociate the tissues down to a single cell suspension, and we can actually cryopreserve the roughly one to six billion cells that we recover for long-term use. When we're ready to prepare these cultures, we simply thaw the cells and plate them into a non-stick culture device. We found previously that Teflon-treated transwells are especially good for this purpose, and they allow us to maintain the cells at a very high density, while still providing sufficient nutrition to the cells through media in the outer well. We can then immediately add our antigen of interest. In my case, I've focused largely on influenza viruses and vaccines. And then we leave the cells to culture for up to 21 days. After a couple of days, the cells will actually start to re-aggregate and form defined structures. And you can see from these stereoscope images at the bottom here that the re-aggregation is actually macroscopically visible and the aggregation is much more pronounced when we add an antigen, in this case, live attenuated influenza vaccine here on the right, compared to our unstimulated control cultures. We also show that tonsil organoids derived from many donors are capable of responding to influenza vaccines. Here I'm showing you day seven data where we measured the frequency of plasma blasts out of total B cells here on the left, what we found was that with LAIV, live attenuated flu vaccine stimulation, we get a significant increase in plasma blast differentiation compared to the unstimulated controlled cultures derived from the same patients. And you can also see right next to it here that most donors also respond to the vaccine by secreting influenza specific IgGs into the culture supernatants. Another benefit of this platform is that we can track responses longitudinally by making replicate cultures or by repeatedly sampling from the same culture supernatant for the presence of flu-specific antibodies. Here I'm showing you just one example donor where we followed the typical trajectory for their response for up to three weeks. And we found that flu-specific antibody production started to be detectable around day seven, and it ramps up until around day 14 where it kind of plateaus, as you can see here. We're also able to track antigen-specific T-cell responses simultaneously, as shown here on the right, where we looked at CD8 T-cell tetramer staining from an HLA-A2 individual using the immunodominant M1 epitope. We found that the CD8 T-cell response could expand as much as tenfold within seven days. I also wanted to show you an example of how we can use tonsil organoids to perform more mechanistic experiments using human primary samples. So as I showed you before, we made organoid cultures with either the native cell composition of their tonsils, shown here as the no depletion condition, or I depleted total CD4 T cells from the starting pool of tonsil cells on day zero, and then cultured these cells into organoids in the presence of live attenuated flu vaccine for one week. After dividing the cohort based on the patient age, I found that organoids derived from our youngest patients, shown here in red, were basically unable to produce a flu-specific antibody response in the absence of CD4 T cells. You can see that these same patients under wild-type conditions were perfectly able to produce flu-specific IgGs. 
when we looked at the antibodies that were produced from the older kids who were still able to sustain an antibody response when the CD4 T cells were absent, we did find that the quality of these antibodies was lessened. So this finding was well matched with what we know from animal models of germinal center responses, which is that CD4 T cells are critical for providing help to B cells and they play an important role in shaping selection. I wanted to conclude the data portion of this talk with a big picture overview of what we hope to achieve using this organoid platform in the future. Our goal is to combine information about the host, including donor demographic information, cell composition from their lymphoid tissues, and then a variety of readouts from immune organoid cultures prepared from their lymphoid tissues and stimulated with a variety of different vaccine antigens and immune modulators and combining that with information from blood-derived measurements to help us build a more predictive model that will help us define the essential features of a protective vaccine response. Ultimately, we hope that these findings will one day contribute to improved vaccine and immunotherapy design. Finally, I would really like to thank my mentors, trainees, and collaborators for their contributions to this work. The organoid model was developed during my postdoc in Mark Davis's lab at Stanford, and I would like to thank him for his continuing guidance and advice. Thank you to my scientific and clinical collaborators at UCI, Stanford, WashU, UVA, and the NIH for reagents, patient consenting and materials collections, and performing assays that were related to this work. Thanks also to our funding sources for supporting this work. And finally, I would like to recognize my wonderful group of trainees shown here in the picture and on the left their names are, are displayed, who bravely joined my lab in the middle of a pandemic and they're doing exceptional and really creative work. Thank you very much for your attention. Our uh, second runner up, Scott Beering is a postdoctoral scholar at UC Berkeley in the laboratory of Dr. Ava Harris. He received his PhD in microbiology from the University of Chicago under the mentorship of Xiong Min Huang. My name is Scott Beering um, and I'm a postdoctoral scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. And I was a finalist for the Michelson Philanthropies and Science Prize for Immunology for my essay on antibodies targeting the non-structural protein one of flaviviruses. I got interested in the field of immunology because I came to appreciate that viral pathogens only exist in the face of coevolution with our immune systems. So I wanted to understand how our immune systems recognized viruses as invading pathogens and use that information to produce new therapeutics and vaccine strategies targeting these viral pathogens. My current research investigates how emerging viral pathogens cause severe disease in humans. So we focus on two viral families at the moment, the flaviviruses, which are mosquito transmitted, and they include dengue virus, Zika virus, and West Nile virus, and more recently, SARS coronavirus 2. We specifically want to use this knowledge from our research to, one, produce new therapeutic and vaccine strategies against these current viruses, the flaviviruses and the coronaviruses, but we also want to apply general themes to even new emerging viruses that we don't know about yet. My ultimate motivation that keeps me going is really twofold. It's both a passion for alleviating global disease burden with the research that I do, but it's also mentoring a new generation of scientists. The Michelson Philanthropies and Science Prize for Immunology will have a great impact um, on my ongoing career, both because the funding will help me to set up new systems to understand how viral pathogens cause disease, but also to help me recruit new lab members and get an independent investigation position to continue this interesting avenue of investigation. Well, hello, everybody. Um, first, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to this event. Um, 
And I'd like to um, start by thanking um, Michelson Philanthropies and Science for allowing us um, to share our work today. We're, I'm very excited to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing to um, understand how flaviviruses cause disease um, and how that knowledge can help us come up with um, versatile um, approaches to produce new vaccines and um, therapeutic targets. And my name is Scott Beering and I'm a postdoctoral scholar um, here at UC Berkeley. First, I'm just going to hide these and then we'll get started. Um, so first I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, flaviviruses and dengue virus specifically. Um, these are positive sense RNA viruses um, of the flaviviridae um, family. Um, and they're spread by insect vectors um, like the Aedes genus mosquitoes. Um, and essentially the, um, the habitat of these mosquitoes um, mirrors where you see um, these viruses spread, so often tropical and subtropical locations. And greater than one half of the world's population um, lives within um, range of infection of a flavivirus, um, which, and they, like I mentioned, they cause a huge um, disease burden. Um, with dengue, Zika, West Nile, Japanese encephalitis, and yellow fever, um, to name a few, which cause diverse disease outcomes, with um, dengue and yellow fever believing to be more of an, a systemic infection with yellow fever targeting the liver, while Zika, West Nile, and Japanese encephalitis more target the brain. Um, and Zika, of course, causes um, other complications like microcephaly. Um, now, very few um, vaccines are available to target flaviviruses, and no approved therapeutics are available. Um, and one of the complications, especially for dengue virus um, to produce a vaccine, is the fact that um, closely related dengue virus serotypes, um, so there are four serotypes for dengue virus, um, can basically enhance infection of another serotype. Um, and the reason for this is the antibodies that are produced against the envelope protein of dengue virus, um, they may be neutralizing against a homotypic infection or that specific serotype, um, but the cross-reactivity may be sub-neutralizing against a different serotype and may actually end up enhancing infection through um, allowing further infection of target cells like monocytes um, by uptake of antibodies complex with, with, with virus in an FC gamma receptor dependent manner. And this increases infection. Um, needless to say, this has basically made making a vaccine challenging. Um, so a major avenue of investigation for us has been to look into alternative targets besides envelope protein. Um, and one such target for flavor viruses is this conserved non-structural protein one or NS1. And NS1 is really interesting because it's found intracellularly and is important for replication of the virus. Um, it can be found as a dimer inside the cell, um, but it's actually also secreted in this hexameric form into the blood of patients from infected cells. And we find um, that more severe forms of disease, so dengue hemorrhagic fever in this case, are found to have higher levels of NS1 compared to less severe forms like dengue fever in this situation. Um, and this NS1 protein has been shown to act as a direct, a direct virulence factor by activating platelets and immune cells, inhibiting complement, or directly triggering endothelial dysfunction and vascular leak, um, which is a major hallmark of, of severe dengue infection and even other viruses. So as I mentioned, flavivirus NS1 causes vascular leak. This has been something we've been showing for some time. And the capacity to cause vascular leak of this NS1 protein um, happens in a tissue-specific manner. Um, so here I'm showing you an in vivo vascular leak model where you can administer a given flavivirus NS1 protein intravenously to mice and then give a tracer dye like dextran conjugated to a fluorescent dye like LS4680. And you can see how much of this dye accumulates in a given organ. So here in red in the brain, and you can appreciate, I hope, that dengue virus, Zika virus, and West Nile virus NS1 causes vascular leak in the brain, um, which correlates with the disease manifestations of these given viruses, while yellow fever virus causes less leak. Um, if you look in the lungs of mice, you can see most vascular leak for dengue, which is known with severe lung complications. Um, and for yellow fever virus, this causes more vascular leak in the liver, while also dengue does this, while West Nile and Zika does not do this. So the point is that it causes vascular leak, and we've been interested to understand how therapeutics can block this pathology and potentially treat multiple virus infections. Um, so to do this, we took both an immunological and a biochemical approach um, to understand the structural basis by which NS1 antibodies block this pathology. Um, so we teamed up with Janet Smith's lab at the University of Michigan, who are actually the people to uh, solve the first crystal structure of NS1, which, um, which revealed this really unique structure um, with 
three distinct domains, beta roll in blue, the wing in yellow, and the beta ladder in red. And one of the first things we wanted to understand is how these unique domains may be conserved amongst flaviviruses and how they may contribute to severe disease. Um, so first we wanted to have a tool to ask this question. As, as I mentioned, we wanted to look at how antibodies may block this pathology. Um, so we used a homemade um, NS1 monoclonal antibody called 2B7, which was raised against DB2 NS1 in our lab some years ago. And what we could show is that this NS1 antibody was actually very protective against a lethal flavivirus challenge. So you can see here that mice that receive passive transfer of 2B7 are partially protected from severe disease um, compared to mice that received an isotype control. Um, this antibody was also protective against vascular leak in vivo and in vitro. Um, so what does this antibody look like in complex with NS1? Well, as I mentioned, Janet Smith's lab, we were able to um, solve this crystal structure. And you could see here the NS1 dimer in green um, and the NS and the 2B7 fab in blue. And you can see it binding strongly um, to the beta ladder of NS1, um, but it binds to the beta ladder in such a way that it comes off in this interesting arc-like projection um, which we predict would interfere with this, uh, this protein from interacting with endothelial cells. Um, so we kind of predict this protective um, mechanism in two ways. One, that it binds directly to the beta ladder, and the second, that it may sterically hinder other domains like the wing domain. So the resolution of this crystal structure was good enough to see specific amino acids that are interacting with the antibody, um, so we predicted that both some of these amino acids may contribute to pathology of NS1, but then also the wing domain might as well. Um, so we made some NS1 mutants. So A303W, E326, and E327 are all in the beta ladder where 2B7 binds. And then we also made a, a, a wing domain mutant, a different domain of NS1. And we could find that these NS1 mutants were all defective um, for causing endothelial hyperpermeability in vitro in this tear assay, which measures um, hyperpermeability across an endothelial cell monolayer. Um, so this predicts that both of these domains are important and suggests this is why 2B7 could be so protective. Um, what was exciting, though, is we found that in red here, the regions of, um, of, of 2B7 beta ladder that were bound to 2B7 were actually fairly conserved amongst many different flaviviruses, um, leading to the potential that maybe 2B7 could bind to NS1 for multiple flaviviruses. And indeed, when we did these ELISA assays, these direct ELISAs, we could find that 2B7 could bind to NS1 from multiple flavivirus serotypes, as well as many different flaviviruses, including Zika, St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile, Japanese encephalitis, Usutu, Wessels Braun, Wawasan, Tick-Borne encephalitis, and Yellow Fever virus. Um, now, we wanted to see if this high cross-reactivity could correlate with cross-protection and functionality of this antibody. And we could find that indeed in vitro, 2B7, both the full length and the FAB, blocked West Nile and Zika virus NS1 from binding to the surface of brain endothelial cells. And this translated in vivo as well. We could find that 2B7 also offered some protection in a lethal Zika virus challenge of mice. And this provided the first proof of concept that one specific therapeutic could block against severe disease of multiple flaviviruses by targeting a, targeting a single conserved flavivirus protein. Um, so obviously some of the future directions, which are very exciting, are expanding this further, looking at more different domains in, to be in NS1 that are, that are highly protective and conserved, and seeing if you can protect against multiple flavivirus um, challenge models using one therapeutic. And we're also engineering 2B7 to be more highly reactive to NS1 and cross-reactive. Um, so to summarize the data I've showed you, um, 2B7 is a flavivirus NS1 um, cross-reactive monoclonal antibody, which is protective, against ns one media vascular leak in vivo and endothelial dysfunction in vitro. And that our crystal structure with 2B7 in complex with NS1 revealed binding to the beta ladder, but then also a direct in, an indirect um, steric hindrance to the wing domain, suggesting that 2B7 may be very protective because it can bind to multiple domains. And that finally, 2B7 provides a proof of concept that we can protect against lethal flavivirus challenge against multiple NS1 proteins, which is extremely important for producing therapeutics that can be used to treat any flavivirus infection, a single therapeutic. Um, so with that, I would like to acknowledge everybody in the Harris lab, including my mentor, Dr. Eva Harris, our collaborator, Dr. Jan Janet Smith and David Akey, who did um, the crystallography here, Dr. Robert Beatty here at UC Berkeley, who produced this antibody in his class some years ago, 
everybody in the Harris Lab, um, collaborators, my source of funding, and you for your attention. I would be happy to take any questions you may have now. Thank you very much. Finally, our grand prize winner, Paul Bestar, is currently working as the chief resident in the Department of Pediatrics at the Necker Hospital for Sick Children in Paris, France. While also doing research in the Necker branch of the laboratory of Jean Laurent Casanova, located at the Imagine Institute in Paris and the Rockefeller University in New York City. My name is Paul Bastard, and I work at the Imagine Institute and at the Rockefeller University. And I received the Michelson Philanthropies and Science Prize for Immunology for my assay, Why Do People Die of COVID 19? I came to the field of immunology because uh, it's an absolutely fascinating and sort of unlimited field. It applies to basically every infection and we are all exposed to infectious diseases. And so understanding immunology is really understanding our relationship with our environment and how our body responds to it. My research focuses on understanding why people suffer of severe infections especially why people suffer of severe or even die of COVID. This has huge impact because if we understand why they had severe infection, we can prevent it, not only for them, but also for all the other patients. The ultimate motivation that keeps me going is really the hope of people being saved because of our research. And by this, I mean applying our basic research to the clinic. It was really wonderful to see how our team's effort uh, was able to be applied directly to the patients and uh, to administer specific treatments to some of the patients that were already hospitalized because of COVID. The Michelson and Science Prize is definitely going to have a huge impact on our work and on my research. It already has shed a spotlight on what we did on our field, which is fantastic. And it's gonna lead to a lot of fruitful collaborations and to a lot of big discoveries because it recognizes the importance of understanding why people suffer from severe infections. Good morning. My name is Paul, and I'm extremely honored today to uh, present the work that was recently awarded the Michelson Philanthropies and Science Prize for Immunology. And I'm extremely uh, grateful for this award. Uh, it's a huge honor. So today, I will briefly discuss uh, the work we have been doing for the last two years, and especially trying to answer the question, why do people die of COVID-19? So here, what we've seen and witnessed in the last two years is uh, our overcrowded ICUs, as you can see in this image here. When we remember and look in uh, what happened in history, we can actually realize that what happened since 2020 actually is very similar to what happened in previous pandemics, such as the Spanish influenza pandemic in the 1918. This is an image in the Massachusetts hospital in 1918. And on the right-hand side, you can see an image in the hospital in Spain in 2020. So to the question of why people die of COVID-19, many very large studies have attempted to understand some epidemiological factors. The, although many um, comorbidities have been associated with severe COVID-19 and death following COVID-19 pneumonia, the factor that is associated with a increased risk of death really is age. And as you can see here with the risk of death increasing a twofold every five years. Nevertheless, within the same age group and within patients with the same comorbidities, there still is huge inter-individual variability. So uh, with the COVID human genetic efforts, jean laurent Casanova teamed up with Helen Sue to try to understand why some people had more severe infections. And here, the idea was to recruit as many individuals as possible, either with very severe COVID-19 pneumonia, or on the other hand, uh, 
patients or individuals with asymptomatic or mild infection. So this effort uh, was relatively successful as it recruited more than 10,000 individuals worldwide from more than 400 hospitals. The idea was to sequence the exome and genome of these patients and to also look for immunological factors that could explain why some individuals had a susceptibility to suffer from severe COVID. And the first hypothesis that we tested was if some patients could have genetic inborn errors of immunity underlying their severity of their COVID-19 pneumonia. So the first pathway we decided to study was a type 1 interferon pathway. Uh, type 1 interferons, since they were discovered in the 1950s, have been shown early on to be one of the most potent antiviral family of cytokines. It's actually an interesting family because there are 17 members, 13 interferon alphas, one interferon omega, and one beta, who are all circulating interferons, and then epsilon and kappa, who are more titular interferons. It's interesting because all these interferons bind to the same receptors, interferon alpha receptor 1 and 2, leading to a very quick antiviral signaling pathway. So we focused on the first cohort of about uh, 800 individuals who had suffered from life-threatening COVID-19 and surprisingly realized that between 1 and 3% of adults who, had, who were previously healthy carried inborn errors of immunity affecting either the production of type 1 interferons or the response, meaning they had a deficiency in type 1 interferons overall. And as you can see here, very surprisingly, we identified several individuals with complete deficiency in this pathway because of a deficiency in the receptor of type 1 interferons called IFNAR1. And as you can see here, the patient does not respond to interferon alpha or beta while the control does. This is very surprising because the previously known patients who had IFNAR1 deficiency were usually suffering from severe infections in early childhood. Now, these findings, first of IFNAR1 and the other genes in the type 1 interferon pathway, comprise for usually young individuals. So we wondered if other um, deficiencies in the type 1 interferon pathway could also lead to life-threatening COVID-19, perhaps in more individuals, and perhaps in the elderly. And so for this, we focused our attention on all 20 bodies against type 1 interferons. These autoantibodies were actually known since the 1980s in patients treated with interferon for several diseases, in women with lupus, in patients with thymoma, and were thought usually to be clinically silent. Nevertheless, when we look back in the literature, we can find an article from Ian Gresser in 1984 showing that interferon deficiency because of type 1 interferons can lead to severe VZV infection. And then we heard about three patients who we knew had all 20 bodies against type 1 interferon because of an autoimmune disease called APS1 and who suffered from critical COVID-19. So knowing the critical role of type 1 interferons to fight viruses, knowing that genetic deficiencies in this pathway can lead to severe COVID, and after hearing about the th these three patients that were children who suffered from severe COVID and had autoantibodies against type 1 interferons, we wondered if these autoantibodies could not indeed underlie life-threatening COVID-19. And so uh, in several studies in 2020 and then 2021, we found that more than 15% of patients with life-threatening COVID-19 pneumonia carried neutralizing autoantibodies against either interferon alpha-2 and or interferon omega. Rarely, they also had autoantibodies against interferon beta. What was interesting is that these autoantibodies were found before infection in all cases tested, meaning they pre-exist the infection and are not caused by it. Also that most of these patients with autoantibodies were men and were usually over 65 years of age, suggesting that these could explain some of the risk factors to suffer from severe COVID-19. And interestingly, the, these findings were replicated worldwide, showing that there does not seem to be any geographic or ethnical background underlying these autoantibodies. So to show and confirm that these autoantibodies were indeed the cause of infection and not just an association, we teamed up with Charlie Rice's team at the Rockefeller. And what they did is an experiment in which uh, we infected 
control cells with SARS-CoV-2 in presence of interferon alpha, one of the type 1 interferons, plus plasma either of healthy controls or patients with the autoantibodies. So when we look at the two blue lines, um, interferon alpha here is able to completely block the viral infection, leading to no detectable virus. Whereas when we incubate not with healthy controlled plasma, but with plasma of patients with autoantibodies, the, these autoantibodies completely block the protective effect of type 1 interferon and lead to very high viral load. And here it's very surprising because if you look at the plasma dilution, even when we dilute 100, 1,000, 10,000 times, these autoantibodies are still able to block the protective effect of interferon. So overall, we realized that these autoantibodies could lead to severe COVID pneumonia. And we then looked at the epidemiology of these autoantibodies in patients with severe COVID and realized that although they were present at all ages, they appeared to be more frequent in the elderly, reaching more than 20% of individuals after eight years old. There's also a high prevalence in men, uh, as I described previously. And so based on these results, we wondered about the prevalence of these autoantibodies in the general population whose samples were collected before COVID-19 arrived. And here we tested more than 34,000 individuals who were previously healthy and who, who had not been infected with COVID. And when looking at the prevalence of the autoantibodies blocking these interferons, we realized that it was relatively low before 65 years of age, between 0.2 and 0.3%. But then suddenly around 65, 70 years reached um, a much higher prevalence all going all the way up to more than 4% after 85 years of age. And we also see a higher prevalence in men after 65 years, where there's an increased prevalence in women before the age of 65. So overall, these autoantibodies are rare below 65 years of age, but then increase sharply with age after 65, 70 years old. So overall, autoantibodies against type 1 interferon underlie critical COVID-19 pneumonia, as do inborn errors of type 1 interferon immunity. And this first step of blocking the immune response leads to a very high viral replication. And then as a second step, the over immune response leading to the infamous cytokine storm. So for the inborn errors of immunity, we usually find them in young individuals below 60 years of age. And while for the autoantibodies, they're found at all ages, but are much more prevalent in individuals over 65, 70 years of age. The biological implications are important. It's quite uh, ironic that autoimmunity attacking intrinsic immunity can lead to severe COVID-19. But this could nevertheless explain the increased risk of severe COVID in the elderly. This has obviously important clinical implications because looking for the autoantibodies can be done easily and quickly with a simple ELISA. These patients should be vaccinated and get boosters as early as possible. And in case of infection, we can treat them with uh, various antiviral cytokines, uh, such as interferon beta, other antivirals, multiple antibodies, or if uh, they are already severe, think of antibody depletion. Now, these findings led to many uh, new questions. What about other viral infections? What about other autoimmune diseases associated with these autoantibodies? Can we think of specific treatments to remove these autoantibodies? And finally, what are the causes of these autoantibodies to type 1 interferons? And these are the questions we're trying to tackle now. With this, I'd like to say merci beaucoup. A huge uh, thank you to Dr. Gary Michelson and Michelson Philanthropies for awarding me this prize to uh, Seth and All Science Magazine and, and their teams. Uh, this has been a huge honor for me. Obviously, I'd like to thank greatly the physicians, their patients, the patients and their families, because despite the COVID-19 pandemic, they have continued to recruit and send us samples. And without them, none of this would have been possible. Obviously, the COVID human genetic effort, our lab, Jean-Laurent Casanova and Laurent Abel, who lead the lab, and then the autoantibody team who's, with whom we've been working on these projects for the last two years. Thank you very much. We now welcome Drs. 
Paul Bastard, Scott Beering, and Lisa Wagger to answer your audience questions. Please submit your questions into the Q&A tab and vote on others' questions you would like to hear answered. If your question is for a specific person, please include their name in your question. Um, so I'll start out with a question for Paul. Paul, why do you think um, the prevalence of these antibodies increases so much with age? And also, why um, do you think it's greater in men, given that often women have greater instances of autoimmune disease? So yeah, thanks, uh, Shannon. These are really <laughs> the questions we're trying to tackle now. Uh, so I don't know yet. What we do know uh, is that in all the diseases in which we found a cause for these autoantibodies, they always relate to the thymus. Uh, so either because of genetic ca causes or thymoma, it's always a thymic defect. So our current hypothesis is that with age, uh, there is a thymic uh, involution or thymic dysplasia that could arise, leading to an abnormal thymic function and to the occurrence of these autoantibodies. So this is what we're trying to do. Obviously, it's not easy to study the thymus. Uh, no one wants to give its... <laughs> his or her thymus, uh, but we're trying to work on uh, indirect markers to assess it, uh, the function at least. And uh, for the prevalence of men so far, we don't know. Uh, our other hypothesis, which we had initially, was that it could be because uh, the occurrence of these O2 antibodies could be controlled by genes uh, located on either the X chromosome or the Y chromosome. Uh, but we have found only one genetic defect explaining this, I mean, going in favor of this hypothesis so far. Uh, and But this could be the case for some men, especially the younger ones. Interesting. Um, we have a question from the audience for Scott. Um, someone from the audience says, congratulations for your work, Scott. I was wondering if you're already working on an NS1-based vaccine for flaviviruses. Um, yeah, actually, there's been a decent amount of previous work um, looking at um, NS1 as a vaccine candidate. And one of the um, earlier findings for the NS1 field that connected NS1 directly to pathogenesis um, was essentially two experiments. Um, one was taking sublethal um, dengue virus challenge and then adding NS1 in trans, which would then exacerbate the infection and increase vascular leak. And the other one was the capacity to protect um, by NS1. Um, so there have been a couple of follow-up studies since then, which have, um, especially from the Harris lab, investigating um, different adjuvants, especially um, cyclic dinucleotides um, to be used um, to adjuvant NS1 vaccines. And at least in murine models, they've been successful. Um, and we've kind of begun the conversation with some clinical collaborators to, um, to pursue this further, to see, um, how to adopt it. I, I think um, the field is still a bit early, um, especially because um, there's some debate on different strains of dengue virus and different different types of uh, dengue virus and different flaviviruses, um, which indicate that some viruses um, cause pathology primarily through their NS1 protein, and then some strains cause a more severe inflammatory response through their envelope and, and matrix protein. Um, so. NS1 is certainly a target that should be included in vaccines, um, but the question of is this going to be sufficient for all flaviviruses and all um, dengue strains is still an open-ended question. But yes, we we are further investigating that. Great, that would be amazing if there was a vaccine for all flaviviruses. Yeah, together, right. Really, um, and what about work to develop the antibody as an immunotherapy um, for those that might. Right. So um, I think kind of as I was sh um, showing in my talk that um, that specific um, monoclonal antibody 2B7, um, it works really well against dengue virus and it's pretty effective against Zika and West Nile. Um, but some more distantly related flu viruses like yellow fever virus, um, it binds minimally too. Um, so we've continued our collaborative efforts with Janet Smith um, to basically further engineer that 2B7 antibody. They've converted it into um, a single chain variable fragment. Um, which we can also show is um, is highly protective in these in vivo models. Um, and they're working to essentially change um, different parts of the antibody to make it more highly cross-protective. Um, so you could potentially use it for passive transfer and as a therapeutic, um, and, and or you could use other therapeutics that also target um, NS1 as well. And a lot of my future work has also been understanding what host factors NS1 binds to 
Um, so you could potentially target the NS1 protein, but then you could potentially target um, key pathways that are important for vascular leak, um, which may be conserved amongst um, all flu viruses. Great. We have a question for Lisa. Lisa, will tonsil organoids become a standard tool to evaluate vaccine candidates before human trials, do you think? Yeah, but, I mean, that's really my hope for the future. I, I think of it as a complementary tool to what exists now. So, you know, going from preclinical animal models to human clinical trials, that's a big jump to make. And, you know, I think any information that we can glean from some in vitro models that are using primary human cells, I think that will be helpful to help us maybe narrow down a little bit to what kinds of responses we're hoping to generate. Do we see what's translatable between mouse and human or, um, you know, issues of immunogenicity that are maybe undesirable, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, what work has to be done still to be able to implement that or is it ready to go as a kind of preclinical model system? Yeah, things we're working on are scalability. So of course, working with primary human tissues has its complications, as I'm sure the other speakers know as well. Um, trying to understand the diversity of human immune responses and then implementing this with all kinds of different vaccine antigens. So you can imagine a response that you might want from a given pathogen or vaccine candidate might be different depending on the type of response that we expect to be protective. Great. Uh, we have another question for Paul. Um, Paul, is the autoantibody to interferon A2 and interferon omega found concurrently in the same person? Yeah, so in most cases, yes. There's uh, approximately 50% of individuals who are positive for alpha-2 who are also positive for omega. What is to be known is that, uh, they, uh, that these two interferons look very much alike. So it's, we're still having a hard time uh, to differentiate if these autoantibodies are cross-reactive or if they're really specific to both cytokines. What we do know is that there are some patients who only have autoantibodies against alpha-2 or omega. So uh, it, it's really interesting, and we're studying the B-cell responses in these patients now to try to better characterize uh, these, uh, how, they, how these antibodies are produced. Mm -hmm. Do you find that antibodies against one or the other are worse than um, yeah, that's each a, other? Yeah. That's interesting, Sue. So, so yeah, the worst case scenario is having against both. If you have against alpha, basically have against all the alphas, the 13. And if you have against the 13 alphas and the omega, there's really no way of compensating in vivo, it seems. And this is, uh, in terms of odds ratio, uh, these patients have the highest odds ratio of dying of COVID. Now, the second to worst is alpha, because you target the 13 alphas, uh, which are really very much alike. And then having omega only is a higher risk, but much lower than having against um, uh, alpha or alpha and omega. Yeah. Interesting. Um, great. Um, for Scott, we have a comment that says, great talk. Do you think... Um, Dengue V2 NS1 mediated vascular leakage in the lung has anything to do with TLR signaling? Right. Um, it's a good question. It has to do again with this kind of like complexity of host factors that are required for NS1 mediated pathogenesis. Um, and the initial papers, um, like that started basically the NS1 pathogenesis field. Um, one of the papers was from um, Dr. Paul Young's group, um, and they um, demonstrate one that NS1 could. Uh, cause vascular leak, and they showed that it also uh, occurred in a TLR4 dependent manner. Um, and the, the the role of TLR4 in NS1 mediated pathogenesis has been has been um, not completely consistent amongst the field. Um, it does seem to be playing a role in some models, um, but one thing that's important to consider is that NS1 um, elicits a different effect on the endothelium directly and on immune cells. Um, so on immune cells, it appears that TLR4 is required and it's required to activate um, production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now on endothelial cells, TLR4 appears to be dispensable. So NS1 can directly interact with the surface of endothelial cells to, to trigger a cell intrinsic vascular leak pathway. And then of course, the pro-inflammatory cytokines that immune cells elicit also um, act on the vasculature to create vascular leak. Um, now in some of the mouse models that we've used in the Harris lab, when we've knocked out TLR4, 
Um, it doesn't appear to have a global effect on vascular leak in that mouse model. Um, now, these, mo these mouse models are complicated, and one of the challenges in the flavivirus field is that um, for flavivirus infection, um, in order to infect the mouse, we have to use type 1 interferon receptor knockout mice um, because they do not naturally infect mice. Um, so that's to say the system can be considered artificial in a way. So yes, TLR4 is involved, but in our animal models, it doesn't appear to contribute to pathogenesis. Hmm. It's interesting that the same protein can have yeah. different actions on different cell types. And yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting protein. Yeah. Um, we have a question for Lisa. Very interesting talk. In the tonsil organoids, can you see the expansion of germinal center specific B cells in response to vaccine? And have you observed if selection and affinity maturation is active? Yes, we went to exhaustive lengths to try to demonstrate this and, and prove to ourselves that what we're seeing is a true germinal center type response. So basically, there's a few ways that we approach this issue. One is just to measure transcriptionally, you know, germinal center type phenotypes, and we definitely see those are present. But another way that we can go about this is to actually deplete any pre-existing memory or germinal center B cells from the moiety of, of cells that exist in the tonsil and then go ahead and culture those cells into organoids. And then we can track basically what should be effectively a naive response. And there we can see that we go from essentially no mutations in the B cell receptors of those B cells to mutations that look like things that we know exist when we vaccinate people for flu. So we see that those antibodies appear over time with the kinetics that we would expect. We see transcriptionally that the B cells acquire a germinal center-like phenotype. And we also see that they're acquiring mutations that are associated with flu-specific antibodies. Great. Yeah, I was wondering if you compared the response in organoid cultures to those in patients. And did you compare like with the same patient tissue to the same patient or um, just in general, like a pool from patients? Yeah, the, the dream experiment would be to recruit a cohort of patients where they're having tonsillectomies and then we can follow them up maybe the next flu season and see how they do in terms of their flu vaccine response. Unfortunately, we were not able to do that this time around, but we yeah. hope to do that in the future. Cool. Um, you mentioned in your talk wanting to correlate with some blood markers or blood measurements. Um, how would blood measurements kind of augment that picture that you get from the organoids? What else would they tell you about the system? Yeah, there, there's a practicality component to this, which is that we can pretty easily get a blood sample from most patients. And so if there's something that we can understand biologically from the tonsil or lymphoid tissues or from producing organoid cultures from those, and then go back and look for a more specific signal that's also detectable in blood, then it becomes more practical in the future to actually use that information. Okay, great. Um, we have another question for Paul. Um, Paul, great talk. Do you have a hypothesis on why interferon alpha seems to be the dominant interferon molecule towards which autoantibodies are generated and not beta, for example? Yeah, thank you. That's a very interesting question too. So uh, I don't have proof, but our hypothesis is that because there's 13 different interferon alphas that are produced in humans, um, they're probably those that have the most autoreactivity against. Uh, also, and they also look all very much alike. So probably when you produce one old interferon alpha, and we know they're, they're also found in the thymus, it's possible that in patients that are... Um, uh, prone to having these autoantibodies because of some genetic or somatic lesion, they uh, immunize themselves against interferon alpha first. This is a hypothesis. We still haven't proven it, uh, but we're working on this. Interesting. Um, and for Scott, um, Scott, how do you consider the problem occurred with people having been infected before with dengue and had a storm after Sinopo dengue vaccine in some trial? Um, how would you overcome that challenge? Yeah, I mean, examples like that is um, essentially why we're interested in investigating NS1 as a therapeutic target. Um, and that kind of gets back to the problem, especially with dengue, of antibody-dependent enhancement, um, making a secondary infection worse. Um, so in that specific situation, 
um, if you uh, vaccinate children who live in dengue endemic areas who may not have had a primary infection. So usually what you get with, with dengue is if you get a primary infection, it's usually non-severe. Um, you produce um, a, an antibody response against that homotypic infecting dengue serotype. And then when you have a secondary infection with a different serotype, um, the non-neutralizing antibodies can enhance that infection and, and lead to severe dengue. Um, so in that specific example, um, the vaccine, which in a, a lot of situations produce neutralizing antibodies against all serotypes, but if you don't produce neutralizing antibodies against just one serotype, that vaccine can act as a primary infection and enhance um, the next infection that that patient sees. That's kind of the challenge. With, 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 with that example, um, people, patients who have prior dengue um, infections can, can still receive that, that vaccine and then they can be protected. Um, but basically that demonstrates this high bar for a dengue vaccine, that if you're going to target um, or produce antibodies against the envelope, you have to be sure that it's gonna produce neutralizing antibodies against all four serotypes. Um, and there's even data now suggesting that Zika virus infection can have an effect on dengue and vice versa. Um, so the closely relatedness of all these flaviviruses really makes you consider um, that a vaccine could potentially affect um, infection with many different flaviviruses. Um, so of course, NS1 is a non-structural protein, which means it's not a component of the, on, of the envelope or the virion of um, flaviviruses itself. So the risk of antibody dependent enh enhancement is considered to be um, not really existent. Um, and we demonstrate this with 2B7, for example, that it doesn't enhance infection. Um, so that's why NS1 is attractive. Um, and in theory, NS1 would be kind of more like treating the symptoms, the vascular leak of the disease, as opposed to kind of like producing a sterile immunity in theory. Um, but yeah, that's how I would address that. And that's kind of why we're interested in pursuing NS1. Yeah, interesting. Um, are there other viruses beyond flaviviruses that this enhancement is an issue? Um, and are there vaccines that they've successfully developed um, to avoid that? Yeah, I, so, so even with SARS-CoV-2, there have been considerations about whether or not you can exacerbate uh, subsequent infections with, with non-neutralizing antibodies. This, this definitely exists for a lot of different viral families. I think it's um, most prominent for the flaviviruses and especially dengue because of how closely related they are, um, which means it's a much higher chance of, of doing this. And I think with other viral infections, it maybe has been less of a concern because um, they're either more related so that more things are neutralizing versus not. But yeah, it's, it's this specific challenge is unique to dengue. Interesting. Um, we have a question for Lisa. Lisa, I was wondering if there are also plans in your lab to investigate viral infections that are affecting lymphoid organs themselves, and who um, and would you think that it's feasible to infect tonsil organoids in that case? Yes, we are we are working on that right now. So you know, one prototypical example is Epstein Barr virus, which is known to infect B cells, and tonsils are filled with B cells. And we think it's going to be an excellent model for investigating the mechanisms of the disease processes and then the corresponding adaptive response that develops to those infected cells. So I have high hopes for that for the future. And yes, our lab is working on that now. Interesting. And for Paul, um, have you uh, looked at interferon level for cancer patients that are infected by COVID-19? Does their immunocompromised state impact any of these autoantibodies or reactions? So we actually just started uh, in pediatric and adult patients. Uh, I, I don't have any results yet. We're testing them I, this week and we'll have, we'll do it for, ne for another few weeks. So we'll know in the next few months. Um, but obviously this is a very interesting question. And yeah. actually, I mean, there's been a lot of debate whether these patients have an increased susceptibility to uh, severe COVID-19. Uh, but some of them do. And so we'll hopefully find if these patients are susceptible because of the autoantibodies. Mm -hmm. um, what types of cancer are you looking at? And is there a reason you chose that type or a treatment um, yeah. that they're on or something? So for, for kids, uh, we chose osteosarcoma because of the intense immune reaction that, that is known in the tumor. 
uh, but this, there's many other tumors in children, but we hadn't, we had a cohort available. So we, we tested and adults, we're also looking at, at patients who are being treated and had been treating, uh, treated, uh, for breast cancer and colorectal cancer for these two. It's been mostly because of collaborations that we set up with, uh, with friends. Uh, mm -hmm. but I think we'd like to then extend it to other types of cancers. Mm -hmm. Those seem like pretty good ones to start with. They're pretty um, common in comparison to others. Yeah. So very applicable. Um, another one for Dr. W uh, Wagger. What uh, future directions pitfalls would you anticipate in adapting the tonsil organoid model to a virally induced tumor tonsil organoid model? Oh, um, I mean, we haven't looked at tumorigenesis or anything like that using the organoid model. I think one of the processes that might be an issue is longevity. So of course, these types of things can take quite a long time to develop in vivo. And it's hard for us to know right now how long we can really push the organoid culture system. You know, we are working from primary cells. And we're not starting from stem cells, we're starting from mature lymphocytes for the most part. So we're working on that. We'd like to see how long we can push the system, you know, whether we can supplement them with something that will keep them going for a longer period of time. And then maybe we have a chance to look at these processes that are more long-term. Um, and a question for Scott. Um, there is an existing yellow fever vaccine. Do you know if these recipients express any anti-NS1 antibodies? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the, the live attenuated 17D yellow fever vaccine um, is in, encodes the entire uh, yellow fever virus, um, and it does produce um, anti-NS1 antibodies. Um, and yeah, we've, we've, we've had some collaborations um, with, di with different industrial partners um, to basically look at the relative contribution of these anti-NS1 antibodies um, to protection and whether in our like NS1 leak assays, these antibodies are protective, and the answer is yes. It, 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 they they are the anti NS1 antibodies are produced. Um, they do offer protection against the pathologies that we study, and it's a really interesting question to understand the relative protection afforded by the E antibodies um, versus the NS1 and yellow fever. Um, at least in the the kind of the plethora of viruses that we study, it's it's a lot more distantly related to dengue. So a lot of the antibodies don't cross react as well. So at least there, we wouldn't expect um, as much issues with like um, antibody dependent enhancement. Um, and the yellow fever um, backbone has been kind of used for some dengue um, vaccine candidates as well. But yeah, absolutely. So antibodies against yellow fever NS1 are protective in our systems. Um, do you know if people who get infected by these viruses also produce that naturally or is it vaccine generated generally? No, um, absolutely. Uh, so, so basically, um, when you get a natural flu virus infection, especially with dengue, the antibodies you produce most prevalently are targeting either the envelope surface protein or the NS1 protein. Um, and it, it certainly appears that these antibodies can be protective. And some of the questions we got in our paper um, was, could a 2B7-like antibody be encoded in the germline? And yeah, we do indeed see um, sequences that look like our 2B7 antibody. Um, and then in looking at some clinical samples, some of the um, other people in our lab have found antibodies that bind to the same domain. Um, and it does appear that um, our beta ladder domain is, um, is, is a pretty common target for um, both natural infection and vaccine. And a couple of different groups have shown that as well at this point. Great. Are these long lasting antibodies or does the immunity kind of wane over time? Uh, I think that's a tricky question. <laughs> um, the specific, so so in, in general, um, there is a natural waning that you see with antibodies, but um, but they do persist, um, especially after a secondary infection to a long mm -hmm. level, but specifically like the 2B7, like anti-NS1 antibodies, I don't have any data to make a, make a claim either way. Great. Um, for Paul, there's also evidence showing that severe COVID-19 is due to the uncontrolled and overactivation of immune response. Do you worry about treatment of interferon beta to severe COVID-19 patients may exacerbate uncontrolled immune response that attack lungs and other organs? 
Oh, yeah, yes, absolutely. So uh, we would recommend interferon beta treatment only in patients who do not have severe uh, COVID-19 pneumonia yet. Uh, ideally, so the two-step sort of model is that the first step you lack type 1 interferon because of the autoantibodies, so you get lots of viruses, and this is where you would want to treat the patients. And when, in f functionally, the patients arrive to the sort of uh, uncontrolled uh, cytokine storm, uh, this is when you do not want to treat with interferon beta. Although we did do it in a few patients who were almost about to die, but we did uh, lots of treatments, steroids, interferon beta, then plasma phoresis to remove the antibodies. Fortunately, the patient survived, but this is such an extreme situation that it's uh, uh, hard to conclude from it. But in any case, interferon beta and actually also the monoclonal antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 would have to be done as early as possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's really tricky with the timing. Yeah, exactly. Finding the so infection. That's why you would need to know beforehand that the patients have the antibodies, ideally. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, about uh, Scott, you mentioned that the yellow fever virus is one of the few live attenuated vaccines. So the patients with autoantibodies are highly susceptible to suffering for, of a severe reaction to this uh, live attenuated vaccine. Wow. Unfortunately, so if you have patients who did have a severe reaction, neurological or, or others, uh, you could look for the autoantibodies to interfere on. Would that also be a reason to not give a live attenuated <clears throat> a live attenuated flu vaccine? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So that kind of holds across different viruses. If it's live attenuated, that would be a danger. Exactly. Yeah. Any so basically, uh, we find that they're susceptible to other viruses, VZV, uh, probably flu. Also, we're still investigating that, uh, but they're highly susceptible to a yellow fever vaccine. A third of our cohort of patients who had severe reactions to the uh, yellow fever vaccine had high titers of the autoantibodies. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think this has been overlooked for so long? Um, it seems to be quite prevalent of a yeah. risk factor. That I, I don't know. So it's interesting for, for yellow fever because many epidemiological risk factors had been described, having lupus, being a man over 55, having thymoma. And when you look at these risk factors, several others, but they're all the same risk factors as of having the autoantibodies to type 1 interferons. And so I guess... It's been sort of two fields that have moved uh, in parallel and just crossed each other because uh, because of COVID or, yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, we have another question for Lisa. Could separated tonsil cells from some kind of structure after extended culturing, um, in, let me try that again. Um, could separating tonsil cells from some kind of structure after extending culturing in vitro or similar or original tonsils? I think they're asking about the re-aggregation that happens when we culture the cells. Okay. So basically, we destroy the original architecture of the tissue when we process them down. So we have single cells. When we plate them, it's just a lawn of cells like you would see from any other, you know, PBMC sample. And what happens is over the first one to three days, I would say, is there's this dramatic reorganization event that happens. And presumably that's going to be dictated by chemokine and chemokine receptor interactions. And those reorganizations end up looking something that's at least somewhat resembling the original tissue. So we see that the B cells kind of recluster together into a follicle-like structure. We see the T cells around the outside. We still have a lot of work to do to understand you know, how those events actually happen Mm -hmm. But I would say that those events happen early and they're kind of sustained over time. So we don't see dramatic changes in the long term, but rather in those early events. Okay. Interesting. And I was also wondering, have you looked at um, differences in responses of the organoids that are derived from men versus women, given the immune responses are often um, stronger in women in general? Yeah, we actually specifically have a grant right now looking at sex-based differences in vaccine and adjuvant responses. And um, my grad student, Mahina Mitchell is working on that project now. And we do see, to my surprise, that even with tonsils derived from children, that we can still see some sex-based differences in B and T cell responses. And you can imagine that perhaps in adults that that 
response difference might even be more amplified. So I think it's encouraging that we see initial differences and we'll see what that looks like in adults as well. Yeah, wow, that's great. Are you looking at um, when you treat with different adjuvants then and seeing um, differences maybe based on different adjuvants but also different um, pathogens or vaccines? Yeah, so those experiments are literally ongoing in the lab right now. <laughs> I mean, it's probably doing that experiment right now. Um, but our early data shows that with the flu vaccine, we do see increased antibody responses from female-derived organoids compared to male-derived organoids. Very interesting. Great. Um, and for Paul, um, let's see. There's a question, is there any effect of, or have you seen any effect of these autoantibodies to interferon um, in long COVID patients? Have you looked at that at all? So yeah, that, that's an interesting topic too. So uh, we've looked at very small cohorts of long COVID patients, probably a few hundred, uh, which is a lot, uh, but uh, I mean, small numbers uh, to conclude. And so far we haven't found any patients with these autoantibodies against type 1 interferon. Um, what is quite different and what might, ex what might explain this is that uh, these long COVID patients did not have severe COVID at the acute phase. Uh, and usually the virus in long COVID patients is not found, at least in the ones we've tested. So it's probably a different mechanism uh, than the one that is uh, happening in the patients with severe COVID or those who have the, the autoantibodies, which is really a viral, acute viral infection, mm -hmm. really severe. Mm -hmm. But we're oh, hoping Paul. to test more patients soon. On that note, is there any possibility of looking at pre versus post infection from long COVID patients and seeing whether there are new self antibodies that develop? Yeah, that, that's we would love to do this. The, the hard part here is to get samples pre COVID infection because uh, we've done it for a few patients with the autoantibodies to prove that they were present before. For all the patients tested, we, we found them before COVID. But now for the long COVID patients, what we're trying to do is look not only at the anti-interferon autoantibodies, but also at sort of a proteome-wide panel of autoantibodies, because we might find some organ-specific antibodies that could explain the symptoms. Uh, and so far, I don't think we have any sample pre-COVID for these individuals that, we, that we're testing now, but obviously, they, these autoantibodies, if we find some, could be induced by the virus. That's really interesting. We have actually a related question. That is, um, do you think there's crosstalk between autoantibody-mediated disease and autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes in either severe manifestation of COVID-19 or perhaps long COVID either? Uh, that's very possible. So what we're doing now is trying to investigate if our, if our patients with anti-interferon autoantibodies have other autoimmune diseases. Surprisingly, most of them don't, uh, which means that they, they really have only the autoantibodies uh, and no other autoantibodies that we can detect at least or, or autoimmune diseases clinically. But we do see uh, some elderly patients who have autoimmune diseases. And so we think that perhaps the anti-interferon autoantibodies could be in some patients sort of the first sign of autoimmunity. Uh, obviously, we, we're starting a several cohorts now to follow up these patients. It's going to take years. Um, but it's possible that for some reason they arise earlier than the other autoantibodies and could be a sort of early onset sign of autoimmunity. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, that's really interesting because, yeah, often we don't know what the trigger for autoimmunity exactly. yeah. is. Um, maybe this is an opportunity to find out. Yeah, Great. I hope so. <laughs> um, and we have one more question for Scott. Um, are you, for the development of a NS1-based vaccine, um, would, we, would you be looking at a platform with a subunit vaccine or you think about a different approach? What would be kind of the best strategy there? Yeah, um, I was kind of mentioning that we were talking about um, doing some of the previous studies in our lab where we were using um, cyclic dinucleotides um, adjuvant to, to adjuvant essentially the vaccine. Um, we, we've done a couple of different approaches, um, but I, I would say we haven't really gone deeply enough on that. And um, there's also um, like like the NS1 field is certainly more complex than um, than I can explain in like a, a small period of time. But one um, complication with the NS1 field is um, 
there are some possible cross reactivity between antibodies raised against NS1 and certain clotting factors um, in our blood. So there's also um, some some worries about using NS1 as a vaccine completely as it is. So um, essentially what you can do is you can make a chimeric NS1 protein um, where the areas that autoantibodies are potentially risen against are, are, are different. So I guess um, a subunit vaccine would probably be the way to go there, but you know, future work will we'll look at that further. Great, interesting. Well, unfortunately we've reached the end of our time today, um, but I invite everyone uh, from the audience to join us in the virtual networking session immediately following the event. If you have any questions left for our panelists or want to continue these conversations um, even with each other. The remote platform allows participants to engage in small group video conversations to further discuss these topics and connect with each other. And you'll find a direct link to the networking session on their closing screen and on the menu on the side of your screen. As we conclude, I'd like to thank Michelson Philanthropies for sponsoring this event and AAAS Science Journals for their contributions. Most importantly, I would like to thank our panelists, Drs. Paul Bastard, Scott Beering, and Lisa Wagger for their time today and for their dedication to the science and research that benefits us all. It's been an honor to speak with you and we look forward to following your work as it progresses. And finally, thank you to our audience for joining us today and participating in these important discussions you can find more free e-panel events on the virtual Keystone Symposia homepage, which is part of our mission to enhance access to cutting edge science to audiences around the world. Tomorrow for Earth Day, we will be hosting an e-panel on climate change and human health. We hope you will join us for another event soon.